I don't know what it was. He's walking upright like a man. Sightings in and around Vermont. Bigfoot sightings across New England have been reported. Red glowing eyes, about seven feet tall. Red eyes, big old fang claws coming out through. Three inches long, you know, just as sharp as they could be. There has been another UFO sighting flying over the Royal Botanic Gardens. There are 500 UFO sightings in the world every month. The truth is out there. It's August, Brandon. It is. It is August. Um, how did August better. happen? I don't know how August happened. Well, the heat hasn't really been affecting me, mainly because I just stay inside all the time now. Oh. Um, so although the I, heat has... I, I, I used to exercise, and then I didn't because of heat. So I, I get that. I, I had gained to mow, a little weight over the heat wave. I, I had to mow my lawn during the heat wave, and it was awful. Just do it in the morning. I did, and it was still hot because it was the heat wave. There's but That's it, true. I, I was, had a touch of the, uh, the heat exhaustion. I, <clears throat> I had to get taken care of, but I looked at my Fitbit thing, and uh, um, it said I was doing... Um, uh, I was in a stage of fat burn for almost seven hours. What the fuck? Yeah, so my heart rate was, was uh, like 140 or something for a Jeez. very long time. And then that led to a little bit of the dehydration. Yeah, it usually does. Um, yeah. But the lo- yard looked so good. <laughs> See, I have, my problem with my yard is that um, the problem with my yard it's on a hill very hilly it's very hilly you've seen it you know it it's a hill and i usually use a non-electric mower because of that yes because it's honestly because it's easier just to have a push like a push rotating motor rotary motor yeah but when it gets long and it got long during the heat wave i think because we had rain before it and it was just like one of those like one two punches where it's like, oh, you're all hydrated, and now it's now there's constant sun. Enjoy. Yeah. Great for the garden. Yeah. Uh, so I had to use my my electric mower because I don't have a gas mower because uh, I don't have a shed because my house isn't zoned for sheds because whatever. Uh, so I don't store because I don't want to store gas in my house for yeah. obvious Fair. reasons. Um, but that thing is heavy. And it's a nuisance because it's a it's a, a corded electric mower, oh. so I like have to constantly like re readjust the extension cord and all that stuff. And being an adult sucks. Being adult sucks. It does. It really, really does. The uh, the, the the. Luckily, my HOA has been like silent. Oh, nice. Yeah. I have my garbage cans in front of my house. I'm a rebel. <laughs> but my house has like this perfect little stoop yeah. to put the garbage cans. See, it do- it has the perfect spot for garbage cans. I'm very happy I don't have an HOA because um, tomorrow I'm taking uh, my dishwasher out and putting it on the street because you can just call the garbage company and say, I have a bulky item that doesn't fit and then they'll just come take it away. Yeah, but an HOA wouldn't be happy about a dishwasher. It's also a dismantled dishwasher to make it lighter and fit through doors easier. Um, I not saw on the purpose. pictures. I saw the I pictures. I was so angry. Whoever, the <laughs> how you leveled the dishwasher, you have to be once it's installed, be on your tummy and reach as far out as your arm goes with a, a socket wrench, and just go. But the, they leveled it like they bottomed it under the counter, so I had to drop it all the way down. Because I installed and then pull new, it up. I installed new tile in my kitchen, so okay. I had to drop it all the way down so I could actually lift it and get the foot over the the floor top. Uh, there there was there were I was saying some bad words to the dishwasher, um, and I, it's it's dis- disassembled to the point it currently is because when I tried to lift it to pull it out, um, I the door. The door, the door, a thing happened to the door, and then it wouldn't close properly. So I was like, "All right, so I'm just gonna move the door um, with a knife." <laughs> <laughs> I was about to say, "I'm like, you're probably just going to like, knowing you, you're probably just gonna use like a power tool or something to disassemble it at that point." There's, it got to the point where it's like, so there's no reason for me to want to remove it intact now. So I'm yeah. going to cut all the wires, 
pull that door off because the door's heavy. And then I was like, well, it's going to, I just don't want, I don't want to deal with a heavy thing. So I just started gutting it. So now like I removed the spinny thing and the shelves and the motor would be a whole thing because they like blow molded the shit in place. So what? <laughs> there's this huge blow molding that I have to remove to remove the motor because everything's it's it's like a clamshell but a really big uh it was so bad and, and the problem i had well i have to replace it anyway and i can't just fix it is because when i ran the dishwasher um water began to flow out of the motor housing over all of the the wire connections so even oh, if i that's good got the leak to stop the electronics would just continue to fill with water that's great that's really yeah. good that's yeah. that's exactly what you want to have happen yeah exactly adult adult yeah. fun yeah adult fun ah oh, jeez. um actually talking about adult fun i gotta check out that store across the street the 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 one next to kai's the, the adult outlet yeah the i've adult never outlet. been in there but i've, I've never just, been in there either i want to go in there and we we're talking about it the other day she's like should we just go and see what it's like yeah let's just go see what's in in that store it's probably just a standard sex shop. It's not like it's not going to be like exotic. The closest thing to a sex shop I've ever been into is a Spencer's Gifts. You know, I thought you were going to say Spencer's, and I was about to say it. And they don't sell that stuff anymore either. They don't sell it anymore. No, even though they're not in the mall, the like the kind of like just through the different things I listen to or human interactions, I forget how I how this information was caught into my brain. But they don't sell this the the nasty stuff anymore. Weird. Yeah. Because that's like, I'm pretty sure that's where people got their nasty stuff in high school. Yeah. Like, I think, I think, if my memory is correct, that's where people got their nasty stuff. I never bought the nasty that, stuff. That was where people got the nasty stuff in high school. And yeah. I know people who have um, acquired nasty stuff post the leaving of Spencer's. So I was like, hey, where'd you get your nasty stuff? And they're like, uh, the adult outlet. I was like, oh, that makes sense. Or ExtremeRestraints.com. Or ExtremeRestraints.com. Man, or- they... Adam they, and Eve. they, extreme restraints, basically is responsible for the Bim Bam being what it is today. I feel like yeah, they they sponsored several podcasts, and that all of the ads were the best. Well, well, uh, extreme restraints sponsored Mabim Bam for like a year solid yeah. it reached a point when extreme restraints left i thought that there was a bit in the show that was missing oh <laughs> so i visited their website oh there's and, like uh, actual porn on that website oh is there actual um no they had it's, product demonstrations the, the product head or, or the, the header on the website is great it's a lady with um it's it's a penis attachment for a sawzall i guess is the best way i can explain it and she looks Kind of like, like, like she looks like, you know how you go to Sam's Club and there's free samples? She looks like she, she's like, do you want a free sample? It's pretty great. I'm, I'm opening this up right now. Yeah. Oh boy. Right. It oh, looks like boy. a sawzall. It looks like if you removed the penis, it could cut through wood. Brandon, you, you buried the lead on this one. This is awesome. I have no, to do you, some you, research. You, Voice you, activated prostate, prostate plug. Brandon. What? You buried the lead on this one. The 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 the, the ad, the header says get up to forty percent off fucking machines. <laughs> I just didn't woman... read. Uh, oh, that's great. God. Okay. Oh, we're, we're gonna we're gonna close extreme restraints for right now. We're not oh, sponsored. See, this, is, this is where we're different. I'm diving we're, deeper. Oh we're not sponsored. Oh. That one doesn't look fun. Oh, they have some not fun ones. Well, they have yeah. ones that are not fun. Well, not fun to you. Some people probably find that real fun. Whatever it is you're whatever it is you're talking about, the way that human sexuality works, some people find that super fun. So, um There's I do <laughs> some things I understand and some things I do not. Like the deluxe <laughs> humbler, I will not describe. And I do not Humbler? It's called the Deluxe Humbler. Electra that... Deluxe Humbler. Aunt Health and Personal. <laughs> See? That's why I said I will not describe and I Well, don't that's understand. on my Amazon search history now. Oh, no. <laughs> I thought it was on ExtremeRestraints.com, but it was on Amazon. No. So, um, 
yeah, I promise you that the rest of this episode is not about sex toys. Yeah, we uh, let's let we all ch- let's 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 start the episode because we got to get away from sex toys. Okay. Um, so this is Cryptopedia. Uh, I'm John. I'm Brandon. I did that totally wrong because my brain is completely fried by what I just saw. Yeah. Uh, every week we talk about paranormal events and whatnot. That that's it. They have quality filtered face masks that aren't nasty. <sighs> Like, like for social distancing? No, it's like a legit five layer filtered. Let let me um. It's like, yeah, it looks like an actual quality mask. They just Brandon, have it. Brandon, if there's a dildo attached to this mask, I'm gonna be very disappointed. No, I just sent you the link, and it's like a legit. They just have a lady make a nasty eye, nasty eyes at you when what to demonstrate it, but then like, the third picture down is like explaining the layering and the material. Oh, I don't think that this is actually um, approved, though, for uh, for social for like 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 you probably shouldn't wear this mask because it has a, it has an air vent in it. Well, it's got two of them. It, it depends what what way they go. Like you just don't yeah, want but, it to let stuff in. You can no, let you stuff don't, out all day long. No, you don't. No, no, that's not the point of that's not the point of masks. The point well, the, is the point is to not let stuff out of the mask. You don't want you, you don't, don't want to other thi- uh, I don't know. You don't want to spread it. The, the the point of wearing the mask is to not spread it to other people. What was the filter on an N95? I don't know. I, well, no, no, I, no, 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 no. What I'm trying to say is what I'm trying to say is you don't want a a an escape route for the the virus particles. Yeah, but the the N95 masks that the, they're talking about is because I had some in the basement, but I couldn't wear them because I do I use them for woodworking. Yeah. Is it's it's to prevent in, the inhalation of dust particles. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So the valve would let stuff it let your breath go out, so you don't fog up your glasses. But the seal would close as you inhale to the, to not let particles in. But the problem isn't that. The problem is if you sneeze or cough, it's supposed to stop the particles from going out. Yeah. Well, that's why you need that's, two two people with. Everyone's, that's why the, everybody's That's why everyone mask. needs a mask. Yes, that's that's the point I'm trying to make. Oh, okay. Anywho, whatever. So this week's this week's thing happened in 1799. Okay. Its taxonomy is Homo sapiens sapiens and its region is Maine. Are you talking about an actual human? I might be talking about an actual human. What do you think this episode is going to be about, Brandon? Humans? I'll give you Humans? Well, I mean, is, it, is episode seventy-four of Cryptopedia human? It's basically human, but it's not not quite. Um, is it the human Z? Oh my god! Do you remember we had to watch that? Yeah, we had to watch that in school. What, that. So, for those of you who don't know, human Z is like it, it, it's basically. A hybrid between a chimpanzee and a human. And there's a movie about, like, the attempt of creating that hybrid, I think. Yeah, Susan Gates' Humanzy. It was the name of the book. It's really weird. Really, really weird. Um, It's definitely bestiality. <laughs> yeah. That's all I'm going to say. Uh... But no, it's it's not the humanzy, and I I feel I feel really gross now, Brandon. Because <laughs> I'm I I had I thought I finally got that out of my brain, and you just brought it back. There's because that mean, was like middle school. That was middle school. Up. I didn't bring up humanzy. You said it's basically human. I that's not me saying it's humanzy. Yeah. No, it's not. Yeah, it is. Okay, um, so this week's episode's a bit of a departure. You didn't get it right, by the way. Oh. I- I'm never in a million years going to cover a humanity on this podcast. There's there's no chance. I just, that's, I, I don't, I wait, don't want to. Wait, 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 Evan, is it actually Danny DeVito or was he born? What year did he say? Not 1799. Oh. No, listen, <laughs> he eats his greens. He has a lot of bulk in his diet, lots of fiber. <sighs> Well, he fell into a pickle vat. 
the it's that pickle juice. Did you see that? Did you see the trailer for American Pickle? It's Seth Rogen and Seth Rogen. No. Seth Rogen has officially reached the Eddie Murphy point in his career. Oh. Um. So this episode is the ghost of Nellie Butler. So it's a ghost story. Oh. And okay. I think it's the first official full episode devoted to a ghost. For yeah. Media. Um. So full disclosure. I first found out about this story on the dollop last year. Oh, okay. um, it was episode 372. And uh, it was the inspiration for me to buy the book that they did their research with and okay. read that book. And what comes out of this is me attempting to make sense of the timeline that was given. Oh, okay. Um, Cause I think that there's some, I think that, that, the dollop episode actually gets some parts of the timeline wrong. It's a funny oh, okay. episode. Don't get don't get me wrong, but I think it it mis it misplaces some stuff, and they don't make any attempt to try and figure out what happened. Okay. Um, which is I thought I thought we would be able to do something along those lines. Um, so before I begin, I want to note two things, or I already noted one of them, which is this is the first episode, um, about ghosts. Uh, the second one is that Nellie Butler is the first major ghost story in America as the country. Okay. So there are ghost stories that predate it. Um, did you get the episode? Let us see. Oh, uh, yes, I do. So um, what I mean by that is this takes place like 15 years after the American Revolution. So this is like newly minted this is newly minted America ghost story. Yes. Is that, is that f new, new America smell? Yeah. It's got that new America smell. There's a lot of puritanism in it. Yes. <laughs> um, so the source for this week's episode, uh, was a collection of primary sources compiled by Marcus Labrizzi. And effectively what it was is it, it's similar to one of the episodes that you talked about in the past where okay. there was a book that was in public domain and this person found that book, uh, transcribed it, annotated it, and then re-released it. Um, oh, there was another okay. editor on it, uh, but basically they, they offered commentary and all that sorts of stuff. Uh, the book in question uh, is going to be in the show notes because I always put the sources in the show notes. Um, the book in question is The Nellie Butler Hauntings, Library of Early Main Literature, Book One by Marcus Labrizzi and Dennis Boyd, who acted as editors. Okay. Um, a retelling of the story is provided by Marcus Labrizzi, and that's kind of the, the skeleton of the story that I'm going to tell you today. Uh, so I, I took that, and then I cross-referenced events against some of the uh, depositions and testimonies that were also in the book to attempt to come up with like a more coherent, concrete timeline of the phenomena, and the things that happened. So, if we're ready, yes. uh, this story takes place in Sullivan, Maine, a small town coast adjacent. At the time of the events, America was still a fledgling country. On its, only on its second president, and I assume Alexander Hamilton was probably out there still rapping about the Reynolds pamphlet. <laughs> yes. Because that's about when this takes place in uh, the, the summertime hit of a 2016 musical. Um, so the town itself was fairly small, clocking in around 500 people at the time of the events. Uh, and I think that translates into like roughly 20 families. Uh, that's, that's a number I heard in some of the sources that I was like browsing about. So pretty small town. It's one of those towns where everyone knows everyone's shit. Wait. So by family, this is this is multi generational, um, no, right? So five hundred no. divided by twenty is twenty five. Yeah. So there are twenty five kids or twenty three kids? What? I I don't know. It's something along those lines. What? Uh, Brandon, Brandon, it's the eighteen hundreds. People had like ten kids easily. Yeah, but how they, they? It's not like everyone had a mansion. No. No, they didn't. <laughs> they then how had you fit kids. that many babies into? One one uh, average colonial building. 
I'm assuming that there were some. I'm assuming that there were like some shelving like, units. Yeah, I mean that's that's how that's Brandon. Back in the day, you just crapped out as many kids as possible because most of them weren't gonna make it past ten. Oh yeah, that's like, true. Just a yeah. fact of the matter. You know, months Rubella, the wolves, uh, the the hodags that came from the Midwest yep, to the Maine. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, all those things. Those are all the problems you got. And then up in Maine, you got the vampires. Yep, those the vampires. Maine vampires. Mm-hmm. Can never forget about the Maine vampires. So our story begins in the winter of 1799. And I want to point this out because the first source I was going to use for this said it was August 9th, 1799, which is totally wrong. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's hard. Oh, so, August, a, a, a brisk August morning. Well, the reason that it was totally wrong is because if you read the primary sources, yes, uh, they literally say November was the first instance of oh, okay. the ghost sighting. Yeah. So, um, and that, that actually, that article, which was like in the New Englander or something, was where I found it. I didn't include in the sources because it's it's a it's a poorly researched article, or at the very least, it's a poorly fact checked article. Um, it made a lot. It said a lot of things that were not in the story at all. Like nowhere were they documented in oh, the primary yeah. sources. So I was just like, "All right, we're putting this article back on the shelf because it's clearly worthless for our podcast." Oh yeah. Um, so the spirit first began to manifest itself in the cellar of the Blasdale family. And it was Lydia Blasdell, the daughter of one of the daughters of the household who had returned home from Boston to recover from a serious illness at the nadir of her illness. The first signs of the haunting began uh, from the, it basically what it was, was it was a series of mysterious rapping and knocking sounds coming from the cellar of the home. The family examined the cellar to no avail and were unable to determine the source of the knocking. Uh, I should note at this point that the father of the family, Abner Blasdell, Blaisdell, I, I don't really know how you pronounce that. Yeah, uh, it, it, it's probably not important. I'd also like to point out, I know what Nadir is from Kerbal Space Program. Yeah? Yep. It's the lowest point. Yep. Yep. No, just uh, saying, educational, good game. I, 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 I will... So I'll say that Kerbal Space Program is a good game, but at some point they became spyware. Oh, I did just want to warn you. Yeah, I don't know if it's still spyware, but I know for a period it was like a spyware thing. Oh, yeah. Hooray! I could always the make. I, I was able to make it to the moon, but then I was not able to make it back to Earth. Oh yeah, no. I, I they cut, go up the round there to trip die. Was hard. They go up to there to die. Yeah, that's that's the speech that didn't get said. I could land. I mean, I, I, I've successfully landed them on the moon before, but I was unable to, to rescue. And then the ones that landed, I could never get them back because I tried to launch rescue missions. <laughs> I, I'm just, I, I wasn't very successful. You just Let's reached just a say, point. You a lot a of Kerbals just like were in space until they died. <laughs> you reached a point where you're just sending cruise after cruise after cruise. Yeah, no, that's exactly what it was. It's like a uh, less funny... But it's like when people fall into water during the winter and then everyone tries to save someone else and you just have like five people who drown yeah. instead of one person. Don't don't be don't be stupid when it comes to I mean, to I'm just going to say for those cur- brave Kerbals stranded in the mud, to them it was a blessing when one of the rescue shuttles just crashed into them. <laughs> well, when, the, when, the, when the rescue shuttle crashed into the mud, uh, they had supplies. <laughs> At the very least, they had freeze-dried Kerbal. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I should note at this point that Abner Blasdale, Blaisdale, Blues, Blah, 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 Blue, Abner Blas Blue uh, was uh, a very religious man. Uh, and that becomes very important in later in the story. Uh, so I guess he, like, with the family prayed that, like, if it was God who was making the noise, keep making it. But if it wasn't, could you please, God, maybe make them stop? Okay. Like, it was weird. It was one of those, like, like, uh, we really don't want to hear this. I mean, unless it's you, God, then yeah. I guess we have to hear it. That that was basically the prayer. <laughs> it was like, great, 
great job, Blasdale. Yeah. It makes you really wonder how much, how much, how many prayers are just like people afraid of the notion of God. Oh yeah, like true, like a please God make it stop unless it's you. Unless it's you, in which case, I guess we gotta just suffer with it. Yeah, kind of an abusive relationship. Not gonna lie. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so at some point in the story. Uh, and I don't have a specific date for this, the knocking progresses to a voice. Um, and I it's happened sometime in December. That's all I know. Whatever. Um, the sources I have are e- either clearly wrong, as I mentioned before, you know, the August 1799 one, or gloss over the point in the story in lieu of the more juicy details to come. Uh, I personally would have found it more useful to know exactly, like, a timeline of events... Uh, but the person who is collecting this data, I don't think cared about a concrete timeline, and we'll get to that. Oh, they're more into the uh, the story writing and, and making it interesting than like a linear, you know, detailing. I think they were more interested in the parts of the story that supported their conclusion. Oh, okay, gotcha. That makes sense. Yeah. So, uh, and I think this is due to a few key facts, other than you know the guy not covering it but because this was such a like a rural it was more or less rural town i mean as far as maine goes it's not the most rural because it's still it's like 200 miles from york which was i think a bigger um whatever but maine is very uh litigious though why do you say that the the uh with the juries and the rural it's a 50 rock joke uh the the rural juror Oh. 30 Jokes Rock, sorry. Great. 50 Rock. I don't know where 50 Rock came from. 30 50 Rock. Rock is a weird place. You don't want to go to 50 Rock. <laughs> don't want to go to... Actually, don't go to 50 Rock. That's the Extreme Restraints Warehouse. That's the Extreme Restraints Warehouse in New York City. It's only one room big. It's a small room. There's a guy named Carl who's sitting on a chair, bound to it, and he can't move. <laughs> it's where they test out the products. Oh, poor Carl. That damn humbler got him again. That fucking humbler. I'm gonna have uh, nightmares about the humbler. Yeah, the humbler I think I deluxe. am too. I don't want. Hum- I don't. I don't want to see the worst version. <laughs> 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 so we couldn't afford the humbler deluxe. What do you got? The humbler. Oh, that's not so bad. It's just made of wood. <laughs> it's got splinters all over it. Oh. Um, but yeah. So there's like no in c2 newspapers co- covering this that i could find okay so we the primary sources we have were gathered like years after the event through like interviews and all that sorts of stuff um that being said this event is likely responsible for uh the future spiritualist movement in america so like this was like the the first spark right um, so for those of you who don't know, the spiritual movement t- took off in like the 40s, 50s, that time period of the 1800s, not not the 1900s. Um, and it got really big in like, you know, the not the the, the Fox sisters came about. Um, there were people snapping bones all over the place, making them crack and pops and the, the toe noises and what have you. Um, but because of that, the occult movement in America wasn't that big. The religious movement in America was huge, and that has a huge play in this story. But, like, occultism was not a thing. So people weren't, like, like studying ghosts and studying the supernatural. They were just like, no, God is real. Christianity yeah. is the only religion that's acceptable. And everything's either a god or a demon. Yeah. That, that was basically the... The yeah, way Alistair, of... Alistair Crowley and, and Anton LaVey didn't come along till later. Well, they were the nineteen. They were even the nineteen hundreds. So they were yeah. they were post spiritualism. Yeah. Well, that the, the, the well that was what the uh, the occult stuff. Because mm-hmm. mm. that wasn't until like much later. Well, no, occultism started in the eighteen hundreds. Like Madame oh, okay. Blavatsky came from the eighteen hundreds. Yeah. And um, that fortune teller robot. The fortune teller robot. Uh, yeah. What's it called? Uh, big. Big. 
big in big the fortune teller robot makes him big oh see i never saw big i've never okay i've seen bits and pieces of big it's one of those movies that i saw on like comedy central or something back in like the aughts or tbs it might have been tbs might have been tbs that 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 was a it was like channel 24 25 and 26 were like a series of channels that i would flick between because i think it was fx Comedy Central and TBS. It was FX Comedy Central, TBS, and at some point, I think it switched over to like FXX. They threw in that extra X. I, I wasn't Comedy around. Central. I wasn't watching it when FXX happened. Uh, no, I didn't. Yeah, I didn't that, watch that, that. that was a good a good spot because you didn't have to type in a number. You could just hit channel up and down to to browse through those. Yeah, I mean that's of course a super local regional thing for our particular cable provider. Yeah, but the, the, you were, the, those were the numbers. 24, 25, those were 26. the numbers. Those were the numbers. Was Comedy Central, FX was 24, um, TBS was 26. And 15 was Discovery. Uh, Discovery. 48 was History. 45, 45 was, Cartoon was Cartoon Network. Network. 42 was 40, MTV. 33 40, was Spike. And 41 I think was BET. 44, thir- I think, was uh, 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 Sci-Fi. E? e? Or it was it 43? E? It was either 43 40, or 44. Think, yeah, those two are close. 32 is Nickelodeon. Uh-huh. 38 was Disney. Wow, we're just... <laughs> <laughs> so this has become an episode about channels that we remember. Uh, <laughs> Jesus. John, it's perfect for the episode. We were channeling. This, this this show's over. We're not gonna make a better joke. We're not. It's just not happening. That's the best joke. You know what? Cryptopedia's canceled. Okay. Brandon ruined it. It's, he ruined it. We'll, we will never top this. We're never gonna top that. We were channeling. <laughs> I just saw you poke yourself in your eye. Oh, great. Uh, I don't. I didn't even feel it. There's no way you can read the copy now. <laughs> oh. Okay. 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 So, getting back to the thing that we should have been channeling, which is the ghost of Nellie Butler, uh, the disembodied voice claimed to be the nearly three years dead Nellie Butler. Okay. So we kind of kind of gave away the the the, the twist on this one. Um, yeah. So now, Brandon, you might. There might be a question that enters your mind at this point. Um, do we have confirmation that she was dead? Yes. Okay. Um, why is a butler showing up in a Blas- the Blasdale home? Oh. Oh, you know what? Oh, I got it. I so, got it. Papa, Papa done had an affair. Well, that's not the. That's not the. That's not where I was leading it. But oh. we're going to continue. Uh, so not much is known about Nellie Butler, actually. Uh, she was born Eleanor Hooper, April 25th, 1776, in the nearby Franklin, Maine. At 19, she was married to George Butler, a young sea captain, captain from a prominent fa- local family. Two years later, she died giving birth to a stillborn child on June 13th, 1797. Local lore indicates that she was buried on Butler's Point, However, there exists no headstone. Overall, Nellie Butler is not a prominent figure in American history for her life. And literally everything that we know about her pre-mortem, I just told you. That's it. That's all the, the like historical record that we have about her. Okay. Um, other than some things that the ghost supposedly said. Got so, you. Are, are ghosts a reliable source of data? I don't believe so, personally, but what do I know? Uh, So, I want to also point out right here and right now, she never lived in the Blasdale family home. The Butlers lived, like, over six miles away, and the Coopers lived over six miles away. So then why ghosts be there? That's a good question, and we're going to... Why ghosts be there? Well, so... When she first manifested in the Blasdale home, she appeared as a disembodied voice capable of flitting around at will. 
the voice, it seemed, was on a mission from God. Ah. And then the Blues Brothers music started playing. Yep. Blah, 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 blah. I don't, I don't remember. That's literally not it at I, all. I, I don't remember. That is the farthest from the Blues Brothers. <laughs> so far away. Um, So I have a funny story about the Blues Brothers. Okay. Uh, my dad told me about the movie. Like, I was talking to my dad about the movie once on okay. a vacation. Good movie. And um, I hadn't seen it at that point. So I suddenly became obsessed with seeing that movie. Right? And I was like, can we go to Barnes & Noble so I can pick up the Blues Brothers so I can watch it in the van on the way back home? Okay. So we we stopped like and we were like I don't know, far west yeah, Pennsylvania or something like that or somewhere close somewhere down south in like like Virginia or something along those lines. We yeah. stopped at a Barnes and Noble. I bought the Blues Brothers movie and then we watched it on the way home. <laughs> <laughs> that is how I saw the Blues Brothers. Okay. It's a very funny movie though. It was a very funny movie, and they had. I was very surprised by the um, Cab Calloway was in it. He was. Um, they had a surprisingly like a, a surprising cast on that movie. Yeah, I, I think Aretha people. Franklin was in it. Was it? Re- uh, 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 okay. Oh, three L, U, E S. It's hard to type with just my left hand. But I can do it. Blues Brothers. Where IMDB, where you be? IMDB, where you be? Yep. Aretha Franklin. Uh, Cab Calloway. Ray Charles. Aretha Franklin. Steve Cropper. Uh, Murphy Dunn. Shaka Khan. James Brown. St- they've got... Um, wow. They had Carrie like Fisher a, was in it? A crazy cast. Steven Spielberg made an appearance in the movie. Wow. Wow. Oh, James Brown. I, I skipped over the first. <laughs> James Brown was the reverend in the film. Huh. Yeah. Wow. It was It was a good movie, and then it had an awful sequel. It did have a bad... I'm just like, they've got a cool-ass cast. Oh, no. Twiggy. Brandon, it's, it's a phenomenal movie. It has really good music. It does. Like, it's a really good film. Uh, like, if you look at the uh, at the, the, the song list, there's 11 songs that were in the movie, but they're all solid. Um, It, it was a good movie. It was a really, yeah. really, really good movie. Uh, I know, I think, yeah, Aretha Franklin uh, sang Think in it. Yeah. Yeah, it was such a good movie. Anywho, uh also a bit of a a bit of a connection there. Um Dan Aykroyd, famed occultist. Yeah, yeah. Aliens and yeah. such. Well, he the reason he made uh Ghostbusters was because he was so interested in the occult. Oh, okay. Him and Harold Ramis, Ramis. I can never pronounce his name. Yeah. Uh they wrote it together. And cool. there's a new one coming out, and I can't wait to see it. There's it was one. supposed to. C- Fun fact: the Ghostbusters video game was the uh, intended to be the third movie, but they couldn't get the funding, so they made a video game. So that's the actual script that would have been used for the third movie. You know what's funny about that game? So uh, when that game released, the particle physics in it were like next level, right? My yeah. computer struggled to play that game. Now it's available on the Switch. <laughs> okay I'm getting older Anywho So uh, Nellie Butler Was on a mission from Gad I think I think that's how Their accent sounded Gad Gid 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 uh, That Lydia Blaisdell Age 15 Was to be married To Nellie Butler's widower George Butler Age 29 <laughs> Cool. 
So while not while people married younger in the late 1700s, 18 and 19 in this particular region was the common age that people got married. 15 was particularly rare, although not unheard of. Yeah. Huh. Reportedly, Abner Blasdale, Lydia's father, uh, rejected to this. Like, rejected to this idea. And I don't blame him. Yeah, I mean, you shouldn't be married and have a favorite Paw Patrol character. I don't know if at 15 you still have a favorite Paw Patrol character. Also, I'm pretty sure that people who have children who are married definitely have a favorite Paw Patrol character. Or at the very least, they have a least favorite Paw Patrol character. What do... What what do teen teenagers like? What's I I'm so I know what I liked. Is Pokemon still cool? I I I don't know. Honestly, I don't know. Um, so I'm pretty sure TikTok is involved. Okay. Yep. Yep. The TikTok. I, for, for, I, is is Fortnite still popular? I see. The thing is, I don't know. I don't know. I, I think I Roblox has either. taken over. I think Roblox, Roblox. has replaced Fortnite. Yeah. I think it has. I'm not sure though. Um, if if the people who I play VR chat with are any indication, uh, five year olds love VR chat, which is really bad. Oh, considering the Actually, number of Roblox. Big... So the the um, I was listening to the Post Malone interview on Joe Rogan uh, podcast while I was at work just to have something to listen to. He mm-hmm. um, I uh, took eight mushrooms and wrote a. What he he called a two-hour Coachella set from just the sounds in Roblox. Yeah, yeah. I was like, that sounds like a night. It that sounds like a nightmare to yeah. me. I don't want to ever hear that. <laughs> <sighs> uh, anywho, Jesus. So we're, we're going to move from that horrifying thing back to the other, the horrifying thing that spawned it, which is 15 year old getting married. Um, so based on my reading of the text, it looks like Abner was the first person to acquiesce to the demands of Nellie, uh, informing Moses and George Butler of Nellie's fiat. Naturally, the butlers objected to the request at first. You'll notice that I said at first. Yeah. <laughs> um. So. The reason Abner comes around on it is because Nellie says that she's a messenger from God. And he's religious. Oh. And they, they know his game. They know his game. So on New Year's Day, 1800, Abner and Lydia crossed the Tauntaun River once again to visit the Buzzlers. However, in addition to the 15-year-old Lydia, uh, who, you know, recently recovered from a light-threatening condition, uh, they were accompanied by Nellie Butler, the ghost. Oh, supposedly it traveled the, with them. The ghost traveled with them, oh, who reportedly okay. calmed the nervous Lydia who was nervous because she was being <sighs> groomed, I want to say is the correct word for this, to be a 29-year-old man's child bride. <laughs> yeah. See, my the biggest problem with this situation that's happening is the that... The fact that she's 15. Ghosts generally don't calm people. So there's the... Th- there's the thorn. That's, uh, that's I don't the think that's the problem with the story. I want to say, Brandon, that is not the biggest problem that's, at all. The biggest problem is definitely the fact that she's a 15 year old child who is calmed by ghosts. Actually, that might be worse. She's a killer. She there's something wrong with her. If all right, ghosts are not ghosts, necess- ghosts are not necessarily evil in stories. There's non-corporeal some good corporeal things are scary. I mean. It, Technically, if we're going off Christianity, isn't the Holy Ghost technically a ghost? They don't. They never. There's. Here's the thing. <laughs> here's the thing about the Holy Ghost and the Holy Spirit. They. The the answer. And listen, I went to like church schools and stuff like that. Like, I, the the thing is, 
the, it's don't worry about it. That that's whenever you ask a question, the answer is don't yeah, worry don't about worry. it. Yeah, don't worry. Yeah, Brandon, don't it's, worry it's about faith. it. It's faith. That's why it's called. It's don't worry about it. Do you don't have worry faith? about it. Yeah, then don't worry about it. Don't ask that don't question. Don't worry about it. Yeah, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. <laughs> exactly. It's oh the the Holy Spirit was never mentioned in the Old Testament. Don't worry about it. It was always yeah, there. Don't 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 worry about it. It was there. Don't, don't worry about question. it. Shut up. Don't worry about it. Don't worry. Don't about worry it. about it. Don't worry about it. If don't you worry about, about it, it, it's a lack of faith. See that thing you're doing there? You think about it. <laughs> Stop thinking about it. Yeah. I'm not going to go into all my opinions on that. Because then the, then we'll go back to John screaming at the rope in. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. You, you're, you're just asking for the rope in to come uh, out. Can you do a Mopanguari episode for me, please? Mopanguari? It's another, like, rainforest dinosaur. Oh, the Moko Memble. Oh, there's Mokile Membe too. Yep, yep. There's a Mokile few Membe. Mokile Membe is definitely on my hit list. Um, that's going to be an episode. Okay. <laughs> and the reason it's going to be an episode is because I have a distinct memory of watching a a movie or a, a and I'm gonna. I, I want to point out I am using the hardest air quotes in the world for this. A documentary about the Mokile Membe. In which they had video footage of it, but it was like like they 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 recorded like animatronics, and they featured it in the video, and the movie. And I'm just like, what? I was so confused as a they kid. Do it that was a lot. such a animal it was planet so put confusing. on a documentary about mermaids. Like, yeah, but you can talk on. about the historical significance and all that stuff. The yeah, thing, that's, the th- they were talking about historical significance. They, they were it was a literal, uh, like li- literalism. It wasn't like sailors and, and manatees. Oh, it, it was the angle of they are they are here and real. Mm, okay, okay, yeah, yep, yeah. gotcha, gotcha. Um, so, anyways, for those of you who may have missed it, oh, sorry, I left out an important part. So, upon arriving at the Butler residence, Lydia was left outside with the ghost. Okay. It it's a calming ghost. It is New Year's Day. To this psychopath child, it's a psychopath calming ghost. Child. Okay, okay. Um, while Abner re-entered the house and talked to the butlers, Lydia, and, and it literally says that she was left abroad with the, the ghost, which uh, abroad basically just means out and about. Yeah. For all intents and purposes. Wandering around with her uh, her ghost friend. Yeah. Um, so, for those of you who may have missed it, Lydia was basically on her deathbed less than a month prior. And she's now out in Maine winter. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. On New Year's Day. Right? That's what I'm getting at. She's what a psychopath. I'm going to say ghosts She's or not. She's not affected by the cold. She likes ghosts. She's a psychopath. See, you're taking it a different and way than I was taking older men. It. Wow. Once again, Brandon and his victim blaming. <laughs> <laughs> because this this child is definitely the victim of this story, Brandon. <laughs> There's no ifs, ands, and buts about it. She is a victim. It doesn't even matter if she wanted it. She is she's, the victim. She's a child psychopath who probably threatened this man. And that's the only reason why he's even trying to marry her. Like, th- and she's not affected by the cold. Her heart rate, her resting heart rate during, like, trauma is probably, like, what? Like, 60? F- like, that's a, she's a killer. She's a stone-cold killer. Why are you creating this fiction around Lydia Blasdell? You, you, I literally have said three words about, like three sentences about her in the entirety of this this episode so far, and you've created this entire fiction around her. Yeah, that's just what I do. <laughs> so, from my perspective, Think about this Abner's- like before oh we were recording. God. The thing is, you give me a, a tiny threat, and I'll go and I make the wild accusations. <laughs> I know you do. I know you do. But I was ex- I was expecting you not to make wild accusations against a literal child in a story about a ghost. Yeah. <laughs> also, if you're 15 and listening to this, I'm sorry, but I do consider you a child. <laughs> not oh, no yeah. offense. No offense. I I 
I have difficulty acknowledging that people younger than 25 exist still. Yeah, I think that's um, that, that's a, a moving bar that's just going to continue to like oh, no, travel no, no. as we grow in age. Because kind of the weird, there's a lot of weird things about the story, but like we are the same age as the guy in this. Oh yeah, so no, it's no. like to talk to someone her age. It's just like what would be excruciating. What do you even, what do you like, even what talk do you about? Have, what do you yeah, even what do you talk, talk about? about? What, I mean, this is the 1700s, so like it's not like how different can their interests be? I guess like. What was it? Hoops, hoops, sticks and hoops. Is that like their video games back then? Well, they had like they did have tops, like like wind like but not wind up tops, got, but like the kind with like the string where you'd wrap it around a wooden top yeah, and then so you pull got, it. Spin a wooden top, hit a, a hoop with a stick, and see a fart can roll, and maybe like cornhole. Which still I don't like now, the name cornhole, of that game. Cornhole's too advanced of a technology. Yeah, you got to cut holes in wood. And if you don't have plywood, like, what's the point? It needs to be made out of plywood. Imagine the quality of the cornhole uh, games that would have existed back then. <laughs> they would probably be terrible. No, it's not just, like, plywood. Like, it'd be, like, a nice slab of, like, um, a jointed maple or something. Like, they, they probably had quality cornhole. Why would you use jointed maple? Because they have way more free time than we do. No, they don't. They have less free time, if anything. Hell, it's not like they've got a, a podcast or, like, a job. Brandon! Brandon! They have to, like, tend the fields and, like, brush the cotton out so they can turn it into clothing and then spin the thread and then sew the... then weave the fabric and sew the clothes. And... Yeah, you you're actually, in, in retrospect, I wasn't considering the lack of a Coles or a Target. Yes! <laughs> Um, uh, I just looked it up, and it looks like a uh, cornhole originated in 1883. Oh, okay. What was it called then? Because it can't have been called cornhole. I don't know how to pronounce French, but there was a patent for a game called Parlor Coitus. 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 I like it's the Parlor Coitus. Yeah, There's it's nothing better than some Parlor Coitus. It's Q U O I T S, um, and it was described. Uh, the patent was held by Heiliger de Wint. So okay. Weird to think of, like it's weird to imagine that there exist patents for games that are just uh, ubiquitous to us. Oh yeah, like like the thought that at one point horseshoes was like the hottest shit horseshoes was like the halo like of its going time to someone's like barbecue as a child and being like oh shit they got horseshoes you know that's a like so i've noticed this but like i feel like the types of games that are at people's houses during barbecues changes over the years I've got horseshoes. Um, and it, it, like, cycles, because I don't feel like people get as stoked about horseshoes anymore. You know, that's, in I general. think that's true. Yeah. Like, like, I feel like in the 90s, people were stoked about horseshoes. My family had a horseshoe, like, an actual, like, <coughs> pit. So it wasn't, like, get it from Target and hammer sticks in the ground, kind of. Uh, no, yeah, you had to make it. You had to, it like, was, like, get... a square sand pit for the horseshoe to land along, uh, for the so it, like, had an actual pit. I think they still yeah. have those. That yeah. you can, yeah, but but who makes those now? Who 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 takes the time yeah. to make a horseshoe pit? Because I have horseshoes, but what I do is they just stay in the garage, and when someone wants to play, I just hammer the thing into the well, ground. We played it at the last, uh, the the last last summer, the, in la the before last summer times. in the before times when we could actually socialize, yeah, and and see each other in person, yeah. <laughs> Man, <laughs> Nick got fucking drunk. He drank a gallon of um, whatever that's called when you put uh, fruit and wine together. I don't know what that is. On top of regular beer and um, uh, 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 whiskey. So, Brandon, I just realized something. Yeah. We're barely into this episode. Yeah. In terms of content. Yes. And we're at 55 minutes. Oh, okay. 
so let's keep going and we might have to take a mid-episode break on this one okay because <laughs> there's a lot here <laughs> um so conveniently the ghost did not enter the house of lydia when she was called in by moses butler and the blasdales were once again rejected so both the ghost and the butler family decide at this point that david hooper Nellie's father should enter the story. <coughs> when told about the events by George, David is quoted as saying, the case is such that I have no advice to give, which translated to modern English is roughly, fuck if I know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so David then reportedly went to the Blasdale family home to talk to the ghost of Nellie. He affirmed that it was his daughter after a conversation and was like super stoked to talk to his daughter again, I guess. And was immediately followed by George Butler, who affirmed it was his wife. In his deposition, which is a weird thing to say when talking about someone seeing a ghost, George claims he had the following conversation with Nellie. The voice asked me, Do you not remember what I told you when I was alive? I answered, I do not really know what you mean. The voice said, Do you not remember I told you I did not think I should live long with you? I told you that if you were to leave me, I should never wish to change my condition, but if that I was to leave you, I could not blame you if you did. So basically that's like, I don't think I'm going to live long. If I die, you can remarry. That That's basically what that says. I mean, in that time period, I feel like everyone probably had that conversation because nobody was going to live long. I do too. I feel like, I feel like that's not like, I've even, I've even had that conversation in my relationship in modern times oh nice so it's it's kind of like it's kind of like one of those things where it's like i just feel like people get worried about dying yeah and they talk about it with their partner and significant other because that's a human thing to do so to me that proves literally nothing yeah uh so at this point george suddenly decides you know what i'm okay with a beelophilia now, if you don't know um, so what that is... That's a word I have not heard in a casual conversation in a while. <laughs> it's a form of chronophilia. Uh, it's like... It, it, it's it's around 15 if you're attracted... Oh, you're, if, I wish that wasn't in my search history now. Yeah, now you have it. It's not... So the thing is, most people will use the, the shorthand of pedophilia, but yeah. technically, avilophilia is the correct term there. It's just as gross. Yeah, it, it's like if there are different philias for a, different age ranges. Yeah, it's a form of chronophilia. There are different philias for different age range, uh. ranges. Yeah, you're welcome for knowing about that. Because I, I I, knew about the term in the past, um, and I looked it up, and I'm like, oh, there's even more. Uh, I think it's a post-pubescent person who's still not quite fully. It's a pubescent person. It's someone who's yeah. not fully... Well, it's according to the... It's a primary sexual interest in mid to late adolescence, generally ages 15 to 19, uh, which originally was used in the late 19th to mid 20th century. Um, and then they just go on to the different uh, yeah. parts of chronophilia. It's super gross. So, yeah. uh, But you know what? It gets grosser, Brandon. Oh, are they going to bring out the... Um, the 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 whatever that toy was from earlier, the deluxe the humbler, uh, the deluxe humbler. They didn't have the de- they didn't have the deluxe in those days. Uh, no. So as Lydia Blasdale and I stood side and side alone, she had her left arm around me and right hand holding the forward part of my waistcoat. Her head was leaning against my breast. There was something apparently to my view right before me, like a person in a winding sheet. Her arms folded under the sheet, and on her arm appeared to be a very small child. I reached out to take hold of it. I saw my hand in the middle of it, but could feel nothing. I love that the ghost description is actually person in a sheet. It is literally person in a sheet. Yeah, that's that's uh, kind of amazing. So I want to point out something that I found out about. So inc- incidentally, I found some accounts that George had in fact had his eyes on Lydia for two full years prior to the events of the story. I couldn't find any evidence in my primary sources. Um, 
But Abraham Cummings, the person who compiled the primary sources, appeared to side with George later in the story. So this might be a case of him uh, deliberately hiding the creepy shit that his friend was uh, doing. Yeah. Because if that's correct, George started eyeing Lydia when she was 13. Yeah. Hmm. And it was only a year after Nellie had died. So super gross. Super great. Yeah. Cool guy. Cool yeah, guy. Yeah, uh, I love I love George Butler. He's the hero of the story. He he definitely <laughs> is. You know what that really means though? That psychopath started trying to like threaten this man to marry at 13 so i want to point out i don't have proof that this happened but if it is true awful (laughs) so on january 3rd nelly's sister sally wentworth uh then visit of jg and wentworth like that one it's it's her money and she needs it now it's my money. I need it now. Man, uh. I... So I went... I, I commuted to... I, I sat in the commuter lounge at college a lot because I was a commuter. Yeah. And um, that commercial would always come on the computer commuter lounge TV, like, every day. Daytime television was just a minefield of J.G. Wentworth commercials. All the time. Every channel. All the time. So, I don't know if it's still I know still one thing about J.G. Wentworth, it's that their advertising budget, budget um, was, was huge. 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 Yeah. Absolutely massive. Um, although I think that they... So they use structured settlements, basically, in a new... So that basically what they do is they buy out people's structured settlements and annuities and all those types of things. Um but when they buy it out, they don't give them the full end sum of what they get, right? So, like, say you're getting paid back. Say you're getting, like, um, you had an injury, and a part of the court settlement is you get paid a certain amount every month. J.G. Wentworth would literally be like, okay, here's a lump sum. It's less than what you'd get if you held it out. But here it is. So they're kind of, like, investing with, like, no threat of losing out on, like, what they're making back. Yeah, there, there's no downside as long yeah. as the number people continue to do that at a pace that allows them to remain stable. But exactly. there's no like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it it's one of those things that if you have enough money to start out a business like that, it just pays you dividends. Yeah, that's it's really all it is. Uh, so Sally Wentworth visited the Blasdale home to assess if the ghost was indeed Nellie. Upon hearing the voice, she was convinced it was her sister's voice. However. She couldn't initially understand what it was saying. The voice was described as hoarse and thick, not Nellie in her prime, but Nellie on her deathbed. Sally, ultimately not convinced it was it was her sister, decided that it was an agent of the devil. Nice. Her, her point being, she literally had no idea why her sister would come back to Earth, and an evil spirit made as much or more sense. There, all right, I'll buy it. I, it. I'm I'm gonna say fair. Yeah. So fair. over the course of sightings of Nellie, the ghost appeared in four other cellars around the community in a five mile radius. However, never in the Hooper's home or the Butler home. Or the home she actually died in. Or near where she buried. <laughs> she was buried. <laughs> so it's so, a, that traveling uh, demon, you know? Well, she never appeared anywhere that Nellie would have actually been while she was alive. Or dead, for that matter. Yeah. Um, so at this point, the marriage is made public, and the people are suspicious of the Blasdales, particularly Lydia, and it seems like no one is happy that the marriage is happening. Should be noted, however, I couldn't find people objecting to the age of the difference in the couple, but rather that the fact that the ghost of Nellie Butler had arranged it. Oh, uh, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Stay, stay classy. Classic. Stay classy, history. Yeah. Um... Abner was supposedly unhappy with the marriage, but was convinced it was ordained by God. Why isn't that a letters... movie yet? Or a TV show? Like a phantasmal matchmaker? Definitely is. Super is. There's there's probably like a million and one. Or like a dating show or like... It's not people going on dates. They get possessed by dead people. And then the dead people they're possessed by go on the date through these other people's body. Like, using Brent, that as a method. 
Brandon, I'm going to guarantee to you that that exists. There is no question about that. That that exists. Okay. It has to. It's a good idea. I'm pretty sure I've seen... There's got to be a pilot. Ghost matchmaking, like, as a thing. And also, I think it might even be, like, a thing. There's that show that was on, was it Amazon or Hulu, where the guy gets can get possessed by ghosts no then... i'm not thinking of uh i'm not thinking of uh the tyler labine yeah uh show that i can't remember the name of really good show until they got basically they killed off <sighs> spoiler 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 for the kevin the tyler labine um i forget what the name of it is um did you you watched all of it right yeah, it was good. It was uh, deadbeat. So like he could so, only yeah. he could talk to ghosts, but only when he was high. So it had Danny DeVito's daughter on it, which is up on brand for us. On brand for us, super on brand. Um, after her character leaves the show, it takes a nosedive in quality. Oh yeah. Um. So there's literally a book called The Matchmaking Ghost, Brandon. Oh, okay. So, um, and that came out in 1998. Wow, that was older than I thought it was going to be. Yeah. So, um, anywho. (sighs) Abner was not happy. He was convinced it was ordained by God. So he's like, I'll deal with it. In Letters on the Matter, George Butler was supposedly an ass to both Lydia and Abner during the engagement. So much so that Lydia attempted to break off the engagement and flee. She was stopped by Nellie's ghost, who in its miraculously mirac- miraculous voice solemnly warned her in the hearing of several witnesses that her efforts were in vain and that her affliction would sail with her. There, so, so how do we know it was actually several witnesses? Like, do they, they have m- multiple, like... That's what they say. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, there, there were like, I will say that like over a hundred people are reported as having seen the apparition. Oh, okay. Um, see, that's also so, weird that with that number, cause that seems not that like bandwagony. We'll get into it in a, we'll get into it. I have a lot of theories. Uh, so I'm not really sure what the implication of the ghost's words were other than like, I'm thinking either a, the engagement would follow her B. Lydia was going to be sick again or see the ghost would haunt her ass. Okay. So I'm not really sure exactly what, what the implication was, but there's an implication there. Um, at this point, I really started to wish I knew what disease Lydia had. However, it's only referred to as pestilence, which to me is not a diagnosis, but literary, literary failure. That, that means that it's a, I don't know. She got sick though. She's sick. That's yeah. what that means. What she's she got? Sick. She's got the illness. She what she, she what she got? She's fucked up. <laughs> yeah. So some accounts say that Nelly would disappear after some slight in February of the year. Um, however, I couldn't find corroborating evidence in my main source. So uh, I think it was like Abner's brother or something like that um, offended her in some way and she like disappeared just that's the one telling i heard of it but like i didn't find that in the reading so okay. i'm assuming she just like on and off appeared during this period um so ultimately the wedding did happen on may 28th 1800 and the will of nelly butler was carried out however oh uh, was it a real will well no no her like the ghost will oh yeah that kind of uh, will yeah. So, however, this is not the end of the story. Nellie reportedly appeared to the couple after the wedding, which I hate to use the word couple there because they're not a couple. It's a, a an adult and his child bride. Um, and told them Lydia would have only one child before dying. Nellie would then disappear after inflicting a death curse for 63 days, only to reappear in the Blasdale home that August. What kind of so, death curse? What? What kind of death curse? That she would die after giving birth to her child. Oh, okay. So basically she would she would she, die she, the same way. 
That's how as, she's guaranteed to only have one kid. Is that after kid one, she, she croaks? Okay. Yeah, it's the same. It's the same concept as it's literally the same thing that happened to Nellie herself. Is what they're saying. Okay. So she's going to die immediately after. Yeah. Um, yeah, giving birth. So that's that's like the death curse that Nellie inflicts upon her. So the second phase of the haunting almost appears to be a direct rebuttal to the accusations that began swirling around the the events during the 63 days that the ghost had disappeared. Claims that the ghost of Nellie had been a demonic entity or that Lily and her older sister, age 20, Hannah, had been the architect of the haunting uh, ran rampant in the community. So basically people are saying like, this was a scam. This was either A, Uh, this was a hoax or B, that's a fucking demon. There's, I mean, I, uh, I mean, it, but th- there's a scale of this or that, and I feel like this scale, go, like there's reasonable, like oh, it, it was you know a hoax perhaps, and then the or demon it seems like that the the scale, the arm of the scale goes way out to one side on that latter I mean- part. To be fair, uh, I always my 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 one scale, my non reasonable scale is always it's a demon. That's true. I mean, whenever I get a uh, eight hundred number call, um, I usually look demon. at it and go, "It's either a phone scam or a demon." Or a demon. And a the demon. reason it's... I don't answer is because I don't want to talk to a demon. Really, though, like you wouldn't want to just kind of talk to a demon. Actually, it'd probably be pretty sweet. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm. I know you, Brandon. You yeah. probably want to talk to a demon. I'd be like, "Listen, we can't be friends, but but I want to <laughs> talk." Yeah, sit down. Let's have a, a conversation. Yeah. Um. So on August first, the sudden the spirit suddenly reappeared to the Blasdales, and a firestorm of supernatural activity began. The ghost had reappeared and began requesting to see people in the town. Paul Simpson was the first requested by the ghost. Paul asked the ghost if she loved Christ, to which she replied in the affirmative and broke out in singing alleluias. Oh, okay. Maybe it's a demon that... Well, demons, the thing about them is that um, they're not, they can't lie. So one, like, That's best question actually ever. not they true. They can never lie. Demons can never... So ask if they're like Jesus, and mm. then boom. So one, clearly not a demon. Two, demons never... There, there's no tales that exist about the devil and musical talent. That That's just a thing. That There's <laughs> nothing like that out there. I don't know. This is kind of reminding me of The Exorcist a little. <laughs> I don't know, man. Ah, oh, man. I, I love The Devil Went Down to Georgia. That's like my favorite country song. Oh, yeah. I don't they're... even know if it's a country song. It's It's... It's my favorite folk it song. It's a country song. This devil went down to Georgia, and then there's like a bunch of different versions of it that, that are uh, good. And then um, there's everything Johnny Cash ever made. Johnny Cash. Then if there's he touched that it. guitar guy in the crossroads. Uh, yeah. Then there's um, Ingvay Malmsteen. Man, I miss old school country as a thing. Like pop country is like so gross. Oh, pop country is terrible. I like, um, there's this band called Maylene and the Sons of Disaster, and it's yeah. like if metal and country were together. That's amazing. It's so good. That's actually a really cool sound to me. Yeah. That would be great. Oh, yeah. It, it's it's one of those things where country isn't inherently bad. It's just, there's a lot of bad acts <laughs> in country. There are so like um, they're they're like a hard rock band, but they've got um, uh, like tough as John Jacobs is the name of a song. So like that's if you didn't hear them, you'd be like, oh, that's that's country, um, uh, like dry the river. It's very country. It's it's country. It's hard hard country. There is a man shirtless in this video. Oh, are you watching some? <laughs> well, I I just I just opened I I searched uh, t- tough as John Jacobs. Oh. Oh God. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's very clearly country guitar riffs, but oh, it's yeah. played metal style. Yeah. Like it's great. They've got banjos and some stuff. The like like all the chord progressions are country. 
Yeah. It's, it's off just country, heavy. country, but heavy. Yeah. That's pretty great. I'm not going to lie. It's, it's yeah. pretty good. Um, so, anywho, uh, the ghost had become overtly religious. Oh, okay. Uh, interestingly, George and Lydia were not in town for the first week of August when things started to accelerate. And I have my suspicions as to why the ghost became more religious. And I don't think that it's that difficult to make that c- connection. It, yeah, it. I mean, it. it um, I mean, there's this door to door person. The family wasn't home, but the ghost was. Oh yeah, no, no. They they got they got uh, proselytized to by some time traveling Mormons. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. That's how that's how it always happens. Yeah. Really shouldn't have let the Mormons get a hold of the time travel technology. That also sounds like a great like uh, like. I feel like Trey Parker needs to start working on that. The time traveling Mormon. <laughs> oh man, what would happen? Like, because I feel like the time traveling Mormon would like have its have their um. I call the Mormon its. God, what's <laughs> wrong with me? Uh, would have their like reality shattered by that though. But um, then again, Mormonism's like kind of like a sci-fi religion, like a eighteen hundred sci-fi. There's a lot of ways you could go with it, which is why I think that um it would be great as a TV series, and every mm. episode is a bottle episode, like the, got, like Quantum Leap. Yeah, where so like, at, like every episode has a natural start and an end. Every episode oh. starts with them discovering the time machine, but like in one, like they just like it shatters their reality and they just have like a breakdown and then episode two they invent time travel again so it's a new start every episode but like this time eaten by a dinosaur or like do something and then like go back and it, like there, there's a beginning and end to every episode brandon yeah that's a great idea but i had another idea yes quantum leap but the main character is mormon okay and think Scottish? about that for a second no, not not Aunt Scottish. The main character is Mormon. What happened? Oh, they quantum leapt. They're in a gay man's body. Oh, and that that allows them to have all these different experiences. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. But but in unlike Quantum Leap, they they leap into the middle of them doing something. So like they'll leap into someone <laughs> drinking some caffeine. Oh. So they're just drinking a coke and they're like, <laughs> no. <laughs> Cut to the cut to the uh, the uh, the opening sequence of the show. Yeah, <laughs> I would love that. I would I would love that show. There's um, Matt Stone. Go, get on. Please. It. Uh, so the ghost began to show itself to large groups in the Blasdale home, and Abner was uh, suspiciously active in organizing these meetings of people. Being okay. a devout man, he viewed these as messages from God. And as such, on the 3rd of August, a group of people had visited the home, and while knocking was heard, no voices appeared until daybreak. At dawn, knockings began again, and a man who was staying in the house, Thomas Oran, examined the cellar to find no one there. Everyone in the house then entered the cellar, and the voice appeared. The vo- uh, Thomas asked if the voice was from God or misery, at which point... The voice broke out into praise. The ghost then appeared to those who wanted to see it. Oddly, the voice then got extremely specific. And this is a direct quote from Thomas Oran's deposition. Lydia Blasdale was not in the cellar while the foregoing was talk. Lydia Blasdale was not in the cellar while the foregoing talk was. The spirit asked me if I would not clear Lydia. I answered I would, for it was not she who talked. Okay. Very strangely specific protestation by the ghost, yeah. which might begin to inspire some doubt. Uh, oddly missing from Iran's account, there was something else that happened that night, and this is from the testimony of Mary Gordon. <clears throat> At first, the apparition was a mere mass of light, then grew into personal form, about as tall as myself. We stood in two ranks, about four or five feet apart. Between these two ranks, she slowly passed and repassed so that any of us could have handled her, which is a really weird term for saying touched. Um, (laughs) It's really gross. Real, real gross to me. 
Uh, when she passed me by, her nearness was that of contact, so that if there had been a substance, I should have certainly felt it. The glow of the apparition had a constant tremulous motion. At last, the personal form became shapeless, expanded every way, and then vanished in a moment. Now, I'm assuming that the ranks were facing each other because I would never turn my get back to a ghost. Never turn it back to a ghost. That's what they Fact. always say. Don't turn your back to a ghost. They possess you instantly, or they, they do that thing where they cling to your back, and then you got ghosts on your back, and your shoulders hurt. Yeah, that's that's the worst. That's, that's the worst. All my shoulder pain comes from ghosts that I accidentally turn my back to. That's true. <laughs> <sighs> so, that being said... um. Uh, the testimony asserts that the ghost changed form in front of the guest and it admitted its own light and was intangible. So there's three key things there. Um, the fact that it's changing form, meaning these three things basically are them saying that there's no way this could have just been a person in a sheet because it, gotcha. it, it like apparated. Um, it had a light source and it was intangible and because led lighting didn't exist in the time frame, you know, that is something kind of interesting that it, it is something. John, admitting there was no light. led until the time traveling Mormon went back to the 1700s. You know what? Nellie Butler is the time traveling Mormon. We solved it. We solved it. We Done. solved it. Uh, what is it? 200 year mystery. Done. Yeah. Solved. It's a time traveling Mormon from the future. Yup. Everything is time traveling Mormons. <laughs> <laughs> um, it should be noted, however, that this account only appears in Mary Gordon's testimonies. Others have testimonies in the night in question. However, they don't make mention of this event. Oh, interesting. Sightings continued. However, on August 9th, a documented instance of fraud occurs. On August 9th, the crowd became unruly. The knocking and voice had been heard, but not understood by the crowd. The group, um, and the spirit, basically the group becoming, because the group was in unruly, uh, the spirit said it could not manifest as a result. Upon dissolving for the evening, the crowd determined that it had been deception of some variety. In fact, John Aran, the brother of Thomas Aran, I think, or a relative of some variety, had snuck in the cellar and pretended to be the ghost while another <laughs> guest faked the knocking sound. So was, did he, was it an actual guy in a sheet this time? I think so. I think that, he like literally snuck in and pretended to be a ghost based on what amazing. I read. Um, so basically the crowd is just like, this is all bullshit. Like, look at all the stuff we can make happen. Yeah. Um, so Paul Simpson Jr. became like real dissatisfied and along with two others returned to the house and told Abner, we had all gone off with the opinion that the whole affair was a scheme contrived by your daughters and nothing more. His objective was to determine the source of the activity. The Blasdale family was gathered in a room in sight of Paul, which at this point, I'm thinking, like, Paul has a musket and he's got a train at them. He's like, get in the corner. Get in the corner. I need to know what's going on. Um, a knock then occurred and the group went to the basement to be greeted by the vo voice of the ghost. The ghost then requested the, that they go upstairs so it could manifest and performed an act similar to what had occurred on August 3rd, although it was said to have fluctuated in height. Okay. At some point in this period, Nellie also requested that her child's remains be moved closer to her day, ostensibly so that she may rise, uh, the child may rise at her right hand on Judgment Day. Okay. So now the ghost is making a request to exhume a stillborn child. Yeah. But the the reason makes sense if you're like religious like it, that. If you're religious it makes sense. The the reasoning yeah. makes sense in the time period. Yeah. Um but it's also like a weird request. Yeah. Like like honestly I feel like if that was N Nelly's main like if that was one of Nellie's concerns, I feel like that would be the first thing she mentioned. True. She wouldn't have waited this long. Yeah, but whatever. So, on August 13th, the saga of Nellie's ghost reaches a climax. That night, the ghost, still insistent on its difference from Lydia, said she must appear at the house of James Miller, somebody who, um, uh, uh, 
basically was saying that this is all hoax. Okay. Um, so she said she has to appear there because this person said, I can't, you, that, that ghost can't appear anywhere other than Abner Blasdale's home. So oh, rather than, gotcha. So rather than apparate to the home, she instead insisted on walking to the home beside Lydia. 48 people that night walked the mile to the Miller house, supposedly with the specter and Lydia trailing behind the group. The group sang a psalm along the way, and upon reaching the home of James Miller, they could hear the rapping of a ghost in the cellar. Uh, the ghost supposedly communicated with some members of the group in that cellar and basically said, like, ah, here I am, I'm here, I'm here, yada, 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 whatever. Gotcha good. Um, and then the crowd gathered in the field as Lydia Blasdale separated herself, and she was, like, wearing dark clothes, and was joined by a woman in white, which ostensibly was the ghost. Yeah. As proof huh. of, like, see, we're not the same person. Yeah. Um, the group then returned to the Blasdale home, and the ghost was mostly never heard from again. Okay. Ultimately, Nellie's child was reinterred that fall. And Lydia did, in fact, die in childbirth about a year later. Oh, okay. So I guess the death curse uh, happened. Held, held true, yeah. Yeah. Uh, by most accounts, the stories of Nellie Butler dry up here. Although, Abraham Cunnings, as I mentioned before, the person who wrote, it and wrote, wrote, it, wrote and gathered depositions and testimonies from witnesses, um, claims to witness her in July of 1806. Two men had claimed to see the ghost of Nellie Butler one evening in a field. About 10 minutes after, I went out to not to see a miracle, for I believe that they had been mistaken. Um, looking towards an eminence 12 rods distance from the house, I saw there, as I supposed, one of the white rocks. This confirmed my opinion of the specter, meaning that it wasn't actually a ghost. Mm. And I paid no more attention to it. Three minutes after, I accidentally looked in the same direction, and the white rock was in the air, and its form oh. a complete globe. With a tincture of red like a damask rose, and its diameter about two feet. It came to me as quick as lightning, and instantly assumed a personal form with a female dress, but not did not appear to be taller than a girl seven years old. So a, a rod is 16 and a half feet. Okay. So that's pretty far. Yeah. That's like, not quite a foot, like, that's like over half a football field. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty, it's a pretty big distance. Um... So, basically, what then happens is the like, the like orb zooms over to him, becomes a, like a seven year old girl, and then immediately he's thinking like, "This is not Nellie Butler. Nellie Butler wasn't seven. She grew as large and as tall as he she has he considered Nellie to be." So he literally oh. is thinking like, "That's not how big she is," and it's like, "Okay, I'll become that big." Oh, okay. I think I think it's total bullshit, personally, but, you know, whatever. So, while a weird-sounding event, I don't know if I buy this story at all. Without With that, the saga of Nellie Butler more or less comes to a close. It does have one last bit of strangeness, though. Okay. As li Upon Lydia's death, George Butler gathered Lydia's belongings into a boat, set them on fire... And set it out to sea from Butler's Point with a tide. The possessions, while still burning, passed the Blastdale home as they went out to sea. <laughs> uh, the exact rationale for burning the burning of her possessions is unknown. Some speculate grief, while as others feel that Lydia's uh, George burnt Lydia's possessions uh, because she was like this girl was a witch or a fraud because this thing actually happened. Um, which is weird to pick and choose what things you uh, accept from a ghost, if you yeah. ask me. Um, like, yeah. Like, they're, they're like, oh, she's a witch because she died because a ghost said it, but she's not a witch because a ghost told me to marry her. No, but that does make me think that um, I want that. Is that a Viking thing? When they when when you die, funeral, I, don't, yeah. I don't want to be buried. I want a Viking funeral. That sounds pretty cool. Brandon, I would a hundred percent attend a Viking funeral. 
I would make sure that happened for you if I was capable of aiming an a-, a bow and arrow. <laughs> we'll get you some training. All right, all right. Um, regardless, Abner was pissed. Uh, Abner saw to George's excommunication from the church that would later form the town, and uh, Abraham Cummings sided with him during this. Not not Abner, but with George, which mm-hmm. kind of muddies the water for this story to me because abraham cummings was the person who gathered all the information yeah so what actually happened brandon what do you think happened Did, from what i've told you what do you think happened i think there are some people being sneaky there that, that's so, really <laughs> I, I think i think that's, you're right. the, that's the extent of of, of it so the story is strange there's a ton of possible motivations for the events and an absurd number of eyewitnesses. Which and is crazy. The other crazy yeah. thing is that um, the ghost being described as an actual person in a sheet and then someone being caught impersonating the ghost by being what I presume was just a person in a sheet. Which, so, which makes me think that perhaps the real ghost that people were seeing was a person in a sheet. Sometimes the ghost was described as being like having like a face. But I, Brandon, it, it's 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 seventeen ninety nine writing. It's so hard to understand. It's hard to understand. The special effects back then sound pretty terrible. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> there's like literally no hard facts here. It's all yeah. anecdotes. It's all testimonies. There's so little known about Nellie Butler that we can't even speak to as whether or not the things that she was saying are in line with what she was like. Yeah. Because there's no records of her. She probably didn't even know how to read or write. Like, let's be real. So there's no, like, there's no concrete record of her existence other than this ghost. Yeah. And that's not even a concrete record. That's just a record of an existence. Um, And as I said before, the primary source of this story uh, was gathered by an incredibly credulous investigator, Abraham Cummings, in the yeah. early 1800s. And there is a distinct sense from the sources uh, that partial, like, like of like complete partiality, like this was not an un- unpartial gathering no. of information. No, not whatsoever. at all. Um, even the stories that they say were detractors, there were only there were less detractor stories. And they barely, like, gave counter evidence to the claims. So, from the story that I was told, however, and that I learned about, I drew a few conclusions. So, there's three lenses that I view this with. First, the lens that George was rumored to have taken an interest of Lydia when she was 13. So, if that's true, then the story takes on the scent of a man going to extreme lengths to ensure his grooming was successful. <laughs> the marriage was not standard for Maine in terms of age gap, and it was almost universally rejected by everyone, including Lydia. Um, only the spirit in George ultimately seemed to be fully on board with it. This theory would require that George had an accomplice, however, but this thread wasn't examined by the investigator, so we can never ever prove that it's real or not but it definitely has the stench of uh a grooming tale yeah it sounds a a lot like that there's another lens that i viewed this with and when i first was reading it this was the one that i thought was the most likely i think abner actually wanted the marriage i think he pushed his daughters into creating a hoax to secure a marriage between his daughter and a prominent local family who was recently, in three years' time, a widower. Not only that, but her daughter, his daughter, nearly died, right? Yeah. So, whatever she had, maybe it was something that he thought she would not make it to adulthood. So then he's like, let's push this. So that's the reason why he pushed the 15-year-old. Because you, like, like, Getting a family member in a prominent family, and if she had a kid... Yeah, then the families are joined prior yeah. to her death. So, to me, that has, like, an economic and social-political type thing, like yeah. a social capital type thing. 
Now, I can't prove that, obviously, but I just get this vibe, right? Um, when you consider that Hannah was roughly the same age as Nellie when her- she died as well, uh, and that the latter instances take a turn towards the gospel, it becomes an appealing hypothesis. Because basically that would be Havner saying, shit, that ghost thing makes my family look like a bunch of devil worshippers. Let's flip this on its head. Uh, hey, Hannah, yeah. you kind of look like Nelly. We knew Nelly while she was alive. Do the gravelly voice she did while she was dying. Yeah. And, you know, as initially the focus of Abner would have been to secure the marriage. And after that, the second wave was to literally remove suspicion. I don't know. It's plausible to me. Yeah, no, it is. It's not, it's not necessarily what happened, but... God, I could see that happening. I could see that happening. The final possible solution, and the one I hate the most, to be totally honest, um, is that Lydia orchestrated it as the rumors at the time were saying. That being said, I don't think that's the case. It really reeks of misogyny and victim blaming because Lydia was absolutely the victim in this story. There's no question about it. She was a victim. There is no reason a 15-year-old should have married a 29-year-old man. As a 29-year-old man, there is no reason a 29-year-old man should have wanted to marry a 15-year-old. <laughs> so, super gross. Super duper gross. There's also, of course, the option that it was in fact a ghost, but it doesn't jive with me because Nellie behaved so much like a human based on the stories. Um... To my knowledge, there are literally no other ghosts that behave like her, and the explanation that it makes that was hoax makes much more sense than that she was a one of a kind entity that never happened in the history before her or since. So, um, I, I, I just had a thought. Um, so one hoax we know hoaxes are a thing, people get caught hoaxing things all the time. I yep. just remembered the um, you remember that one time that they found like a thumb in Wendy's chili and then they had to like give out free drinks or whatever to make up for it yeah um they that was a fake it was a real fake and by that i mean it it was a real human it was a real thumb yeah yeah did oh did you you know what happened like someone owed them money and his lost his thumb in a work accident so they're like your debt is paid if you give us your thumb so that they could sue wendy's I didn't know that that was the the yes. how they got Some, it. Someone owed, it was a couple, and someone uh. owed them money, and they I guess they went to jail for like similar scams in the past. So like someone lost a digit in a workplace accident, and they're like, G- "Give us your finger, and your debt is paid." But the pet, I think, or the 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 debt, I think, was like low, like less than two hundred dollars. <laughs> Amazing, Which makes it even better. I mean, if the thumb could be reattached, I'd be just like. I guess. But I mean, like, for me, losing so a thumb never would be consulted tragic. A medical professional, I, I Wait. imagine. That's my guess, right? Because once, oh. if that happens, then it has to be reported or something like that. The only way that that you could get off paperwork wise is if you never go see a doctor. Oh, you're right. You know, you're right. You're totally right. So that meant this guy o- owed some money, lost a finger, and called these people. And then never got medical attention, I assume. I mean, I, I assume he tied a tourniquet. Yeah, I imagine like he did something himself, but I don't imagine he went to a doctor. He, he probably took like a cigarette lighter and just... Tss- Cauterized it himself. Yeah. Yeah. That would be painful. Um, that being... There is the whole thing of like the spectralness of the ghost, though. And okay. I will say sounds and go- voices are easy to fake. Full stop. Like... Super duper easy. Like, yeah. literally, they could have had a tube of some variety, and they could have done the voices. Yeah. And from what I read, it was a big basement because it could fit, like, 30 people, which is a huge basement. It's a pretty big um, basement. Yeah, especially in colonial times. That's a huge basement. So, I'm thinking that they could have very easily had, like, a false wall or something to accommodate that. Oh, uh, where it gets tricky is the actual specter 
itself. Now, my current pet I thought my thoughts is this was that the hoaxer was able to pull off an early version of Pepper's Ghost. So, if you don't know what Pepper's Ghost is, if you've ever been to the Haunted Mansion in Disneyland or Disney World, you have seen Pepper's Ghost. It's how they do the ghosts. The idea is you have a room where there's a bright, brightly lit object and then some medium that can reflect that that's transparent so that you can see the ghosts like dancing around. Yeah. Um, the ballroom scene in the Haunting Mansion is like the best example of it. Um, hologram Tupac, Hologram Michael Jackson, <laughs> they're all they're all iterations. Hatsune Miku, Hatsune Miku um, the gorillas, they're all iterations of uh, Pepper's Ghost, just more modern. Um, while the effect was popularized in 1862, it had been in existence since the 1500s. And not only that, but you don't need to know about Pepper's Ghost to have Pepper's Ghost happen. Yeah. Like, it could, it could naturally happen, right? Like, say there's, like, a spray of water. You could technically emulate Pepper's Ghost on, like, a mist. Um, so, since the intangible incidents of the ghost appeared in the cellar, my thought is that the culprit determined a means to leverage the dust in the cellar to simulate a ghost. Because it's probably a dusty cellar. Okay. They probably they, there's probably a fair amount of particulate matter flying through the air, and they may have figured out a way to project an image into the room. And if someone puts their hand into it, and they're not used to seeing a projector, yeah, you know, it, it, I'm gonna say that this might be literally because they're not familiar with the special effect. That'd be um, pretty cool. Oh, it'd be. It's a really cool thing, and I, I legitimately. I'm 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 also approaching this that all the stories that were gathered are absolutely true, like the people saw what they saw, right? Oh, okay. So this is me assuming that they saw what they saw. Uh there is no guarantee that the people saw what they saw because it is anecdotal evidence. Yeah, it is. So wait, when did you say I'm just I'm I'm, I'm looking up Pepper's Ghost? So it's been a around 18... so, someone wrote about it in the 1500s or yes. they, they they didn't use that term but they described that that thing. so it's been around since the 1500s yeah. like the concept of it so it's not as though it would be something that would never have it's not an impossible thing for someone in the blasdale family to have known about pepper's ghost yeah or whatever it is in modern times because like um Keep in mind, Lydia had just been to Boston. So it's not even like they were like rural people who never went to cities. True. Um, True. And actually, that, that makes sense because when I was just looking up Pepper's Ghost, um, like the first thing that shows up on Google Images is it being used in what, what looks like a play. Yeah. So if she so, went to like a theater. Yes. She could have just it's, seen it. It's entirely possible that a member of the family found out about the effects somehow. Yeah. That um, seems reasonable. So, and, you know, considering it was visible to the human eye in some cases and covered in a sheet in another, it also allows multiple culprits to act as the ghost. Oh, because yeah. Because they could literally have a person wearing a sheet be the ghost one day, and then somebody who's, like, the cloak looks the most like Nelly the other day. Because yeah. whatever they're doing is an imperfect Pepper's ghost. I guarantee that. That's, there's no doubt about that, right? Um, because there would just be no way to do it. Um, I also didn't mention this, but every time that they went into the basement, Abner would blow out the candle and they would be in pitch darkness. Yeah, see, that I think also helps with like spirits appearing in the middle of somewhere is if it's pitch yeah. black... Uh, yeah. it, it it also explains it also explains um why not everyone would have seen it because it could have literally just been yes ending yeah true so ultimately the real answer is loss of time and at best we can only speculate and wish someone more qualified than a minister had recorded the inter information and investigated America's first ghost story 
bit of a long one this week. Yeah. Um, it, 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 it was enjoyable, though. It, Educational. It's definitely different from what we usually do. Um, but I kind of wanted to start delving into the, dipping a little bit more broadly into the well, the well of the paranormal well of par- stuff. Yep. Yep. Um, because we're about to hit our second year of this show, and Damn. I'm not saying that cryptids are drying up because we still have cryptids, but cryptids that are easy to research have long since dried up. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, now, now it's more like rolling the dice and hoping that you get like a couple like good articles that aren't just copy pastes of yeah one paragraph you know when i first started this when i when we first started this podcast and i first like pitched the idea to you um that's what i meant to say when i first pitched the idea yeah not when i first started this uh when we first started this podcast i thought that this would be really easy oh yeah no it turns out we were I wrong think, i think both of us thought this would be really easy because we're <laughs> yeah. like there's so much stuff about cryptids and ghosts and supernatural things turns out it's all terribly written yeah <laughs> that, or, or like i'll be like oh nice this seems like uh, an article of length but then they start like talking about something else talking about something else or they'll describe things where there's no way they could have known that had happened like yeah. they'll be talking about like encounters and stuff and um you'll, f- you'll i'll read the source material and then i'll read the article and the article will be like like with her trembling hand on the steering wheel, she did this. I'm like, how do you? you your, her hand wasn't trembling. She, she said she saw the thing in this well, they're news article. Well, editorializing. How, why? Why are you expand? Like, trying to put me in the scene. I don't want that. I don't want that. Give me the information. Well, it turns out that a lot of stories are just um, this thing happened. Yep. That, yep. Yep. <laughs> I saw a thing. Yeah. It looked like this. Yeah. You're like, but tell me more. We have to, we have to, we have to actually uh, extract a lot out of the story to actually come up with a cohesive narrative that is enjoyable to listen to. Yeah, I should do one that's just uh, like everything where there's only two sentences on it, and that's it. Oh God! <laughs> Get a fifty cryptid episode. <laughs> it, you're not joking either. No, well, that's where like the fairy grab bag episode came from, is because there's a lot of fairies and not a lot of information. But they all share a common theme. Yeah, I mean, fairies are one of those weird... Fairies were definitely one of those weird things where it's like, it's a thing. Like, it's a thing in history and all that stuff. And, like, um, people, people, like, talk about it. So it's not like it doesn't exist. It's just there's not a lot of concrete evidence. A lot of it's, like, um, or not even evidence, but stories. A lot of it's, like word of mouth and a lot of it's word stories. of mouth and a lot of that is hard to pin like dates on <laughs> this story was actually pretty hard to pin dates on in the early bit um it wasn't until the second wave that things actually started got started to get easy to like say oh this is definitely what happened gotcha yeah. cuz like cuz like there's only like one testimony that dates itself as being in January. Oh, really? Or, okay. Yeah. Like most of them, most of them were like, uh, dated to August. And, um, this is something that I noticed in multiple sources that I read, uh, that people accidentally put the August sightings in the January, February timeframe. Um, the dollop oh. actually did that. The, the story from Mary uh, Goodwell, the dollop reported as happening in the, the winter months. Okay. So, huh. I don't know. It was a weird one. It was a really, really weird episode. Um, a really odd story, I'll yeah. say. And uh, it was good. I will say it's um, significantly more genital-free than the previous two. Well, except for the beginning. S- sans the intro. Sans the intro. The sans intro was the intro. <laughs> the intro was bad. I'm not gonna lie. The intro was bad. Um anywho, that's it. We that's all I got for the episode. So uh as always, if you enjoyed the podcast, be sure to check out our website, cryptopediacast.com. 
Our Instagram is at CryptopediaCast. Our Twitter, also at CryptopediaCast. If you want to email us, CryptopediaCast at gmail.com or us at CryptopediaCast.com. We have a Patreon. Uh, the link is in the show notes. And uh, I think it's your turn, Brandon, because it's uh, my episode, and I think you usually read it on my episodes. Yeah. So we'll thank our Jack Lopes of the patron. We've got Clay Sinclair, Marty Von Party, Bird Schneider. His operation was successful. We have plugged his bones. We Air don't plugged. know what recovery is going to look like, but we'll just like drill a hole in the side, filled it with sand. And now he's great, can't swim. So we, we've got to try to come up with an alternative to swimming pools. And Jonathan Shepard, the newest to the party. Yep. Um, we also actually got someone. So, um, we got someone in our Discord, which I want to oh, plug okay. really quick. We got a new person in our Discord. Um, our Discord is a place where we talk and interact with you guys. Uh, right now, it's mostly patrons, um, but it's open to non-patrons. Patrons just get a little bit extra. They get like uh, access to special boards, like so the sub channels and stuff. Yeah, sub channels yeah. and stuff like that. So basically it's just if you pay us money you get you get extra privilege to talk you get you get less noisy privilege to talk to us <laughs> yeah what channel was the horse meat uh conversation that on? was on general was that general, that was that was general? general. That's free. Okay. yeah yeah that was on general <laughs> um yeah uh so if you enjoyed the podcast be sure to rate review subscribe if you have any monster requests or stories be sure to send them in we have a great track record of completing people's requests yeah we, we pretty bomb yeah we're pretty great at it we're pretty good at it yeah although to be fair we are actually pretty good at it i think we've got like a a 60 percent hit rate on that roughly. <laughs> i would not go to a surgeon with that kind of kind of track record <laughs> it's not rocket science or yeah. brain surgery. No, it's it's almost the opposite. <laughs> it's actually the opposite. Oh, yeah. uh, you could find me on Instagram at donkey underscore hands. My website is boyerb.com. My email is Brandon at cryptopediacast.com and my Twitter is at crypto Brandon. I'm on Instagram at Mew2057. My Twitter is at JF Dunham. My website is John and my email is John at cryptopediacast.com. Our art was done by Tom Hill. You could find him on Instagram at Thomas Michael Hill. His website is greatergloryco.com and his email is tommikehill at gmail.com. As always, I'm John. I'm Brandon. And things are going to get weird. Yeah.